tonight. God bless you. God bless you tonight. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to our Thursday evening service. It's so great to be with you today. We're happy to be able to worship the Lord. I'm just glad that I'm here and I'm here with you and the Lord is with us. We just give God praise and thanks. God bless you for tuning in and I trust that tonight you will be blessed. I trust that you will be enlightened. Every Thursday we meet together and we like to break the bread of God's word. Our Thursday services are more of a teaching service and so we're glad to be here with you just to share the word of God in this COVID-19 season. Well, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're looking after yourself and I hope you're also taking time for self-care, that you will make sure that you're taking time to rest, taking time to, to exercise and taking time for yourself. There's so much to do, so much happening, but don't forget to take care of yourself and we're looking forward to the time when we can come back together but right now we're just so excited to share the word of God with you well over the last few weeks um, I've been just thinking about how our Christian faith our Christian faith deals with crisis and crises and there is one thing I know about Christianity, that Christianity, as one scholar puts it, is infinitely transferable, meaning that no matter what situation, context, regime, no matter what scene or whatever the context may be, Christianity cannot be snuffed out, it cannot be stopped. We've seen throughout history, our Christianity started off as an illegal religion and it grew and it burgeoned. People were burnt by the stake, people were hung, people were uh, boiled in hot pots of water, people were killed in all manner of heinous and wicked ways, but still it could not be stopped. The Bible has been burnt many times and regimes in China and other places have sought to snuff out every the vestiges of the scriptures, but each time it continues to grow. Around the world, um, regime has made it illegal. Christianity in Roman times was the, Ill the, the illegal religion the uh, religion that was outlawed, but still it grew. It was the state religion at one point. Still it grew. Christianity was a religion that grew amongst dictatorships and democracies and liberalisms. It grew in utopias. It, it, no matter what, this message cannot be stopped. There's something about the faith that allows it to adapt and change. And so I was just looking into to what extent is the, our faith through the power of the Spirit morphing and changing and developing and adapting to this season that we're in right now. And I'm telling you this, if we never met again in a church service, if we never had a congregational traditionally meeting together, I'm telling you today, Christianity would continue to grow and even more so, I would say. But, and so I've been thinking through to what extent is, as we, what can we learn from this? Every situation, we must seek to learn something. What can we learn about our Christian faith? As the COVID-19 is, is challenging the way we understand our faith. We practice our faith. And I, and I know that there may not be much to celebrate. But if there was anything that we could celebrate about our faith in this season is that we have seen and we are challenged to, on, to, to ask the question, what does it mean to practice and to live out our faith when we're no longer meeting in houses of worship 
when we are no longer gathering in our denominations, we are no longer gatherings to get in together according to our church traditions in a traditional way. What does it mean when we can no longer define our faith in an activity called going to church on Sunday. We can no longer see our face as we go to a Methodist and a Baptist and a utilitarian, whatever churches we go. Now all we have are people in their homes in society, labelless. People are just in their own context. What does it mean then when we understand that Christianity, whether or not you if you ask someone, for example, what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, most people would say well, they believe in Jesus. And certainly, uh, if you're an evangelical anyway, you, you, I believe, put my trust in Jesus. And if you ask a question, you push them further and you say to them, but what does it mean to be a Christian? Well, it means then that uh, you, I go to church and I we sing, we, uh, we, we help the poor, we, we do missions work, and we translate our faith into activity. We understand our faith according to the things that we do. But what happens if you cannot do the things that you normally do that causes you and helps you to define what your faith is about? Well, this is the dilemma that we are finding ourselves. What a great dilemma it is when we ask ourselves the question, what does it mean to be a Christian when we cannot exercise our faith in the traditional ways that we do it? If there is one daunting corollary, I would say, resulting from the COVID-19 is that it has stripped away the physical institutionalization of Christianity, causing us to ask ourselves, what does it m mean to be a Christian beyond our institutions, beyond our dogma, beyond our context, our traditions, our singing? What does it mean to be a Christian when we cannot even demonstrate our faith the way we would like to in helping the poor, in helping the neighbor? What then does it mean to be a Christian? And this is the great opportunity. This is the serendipity that we can get from the faith because it's causing us to understand the marrow of our faith, the core of our faith, and getting all of that. Because I'm telling you this, when persecution comes, it's not the dross, it's not just the singing and the praising, it's what you understand about your faith that's going to keep you in hard times. Hallelujah. There's a book written by John Wesley called Almost Christian. And he talked about how, you know, you know the, the Bible talks about when, I think it was Herod who said, you, almost you convinced me to be a Christian. Um, I think it was to Paul. And, and this idea of almost Christian, we understand our faith. And Wesley argues that our faith is translated in terms of virtues. That, you know, to be a Christian, it means that you're a good person. To be a Christian, it means that, you, you know, you don't cheat, you don't lie. To be a Christian, it means that you're honest. To be a Christian, it means that you're truthful and that you are God-fearing. Not being a drunkard, I'm not a, uh, uh, you know, I help people. And he says that when you do all of these things, what you have is not altogether Christian, but almost Christian. And so many of us actually translate the fact that we are believers when it only amalgamates to being almost Christian. Because our faith goes beyond the things that we do. Our faith goes beyond that, that our institutions and our structures and the neat compartmentalization that helps us to feel religious. Our faith goes beyond the, the privatization. And what I love about this, this shutdown, if you like, is that it has caused us not to be able to privatize religion or privatize our Christian faith. We can't just con 
to say, let's keep that in the church. We don't mind what you do as long as you keep it in the church. Christianity is a private religion that is exercised in certain buildings. But now we can't go into buildings, as, as it were. We have this more open expression and missional faith in the world. And so I'm asking the question, and that was a rather long introduction, but the question that I am wrestling with then is, what does it mean to be Christian? Not just that, but I'm looking at, and this, this season is causing me to rethink and to think about an holistic Christianity. Hallelujah. Holistic Christianity. Christianity, and this is one of the things that is giving it wings, that it cannot be compartmentalized, silenced, and siloed, and isolated. Christianity is a faith that mustn't just be a, an American faith, or a, 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 a faith that is defined by whether you're conservative or liberal, or whatever you may be. A faith is not just about that. Our Christianity mustn't just be an activity once a week or some things that we do. Christianity must be holistic. Say with me, holistic Christianity. And let me tell you this, this shake-up, this disruption of our faith is causing us to explore how can I be Christian when, I mean, how can I have, be a Christian to my children when I can't bring them to children's church? What does it mean now for me to be a Christian when I don't have a neat Christian um, Sunday school to go to, Bible school to go to, worship team to go to? What, what does it mean and how does my faith that I own pra be practiced when it's down to me? Hallelujah. And so, I want to give you three things as I'm looking at what does it mean? What, what is the marrow of our faith? When they strip away everything, what are the essentials that's going to make you stand? When they strip away everything, what is the things that are going to make you say, but I'm still standing and I still believe? When they take away the music and the instruments and the choirs and the pews and the cathedral, when they take it all away and it's just you standing, what do you need to be able to say, I'm still standing and I still believe? Well, let me give you a few ideas and give you a few nuggets. First of all, you must be converted. Oh, I'm not just talking about uh, a, a signing, signing up to a particular ideology or religion or particular uh, a theology. I'm not talking about having a new philosophy of life. I'm not talking about merely an intellectual cerebral change of opinion. Christian conversion is not self-improvement or culturally conditioned behavior. Christian conversion is not wishful thinking or an opiate for the weak. Neither is it a change of social network or friends or even a change merely in behavior. Christianity is something that is a, a world change. Hallelujah. It's something that is a change from the inside out. It's not to be ascribed to something. And the Bible says, and if you turn with me to a very wonderful passage of scripture that I've been reading for many years. In John chapter 3. And you know it, John chapter 3 and verse 3, that wonderful passage of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a PhD in religion. He knew, he knew the law. He was an expert on jurisprudence. He had possibly memorized most of the Old Testament. He was a scholar. And not just that, but he was a leader of his people, and, uh, of the Jews. A leader of the Jews, the Bible says. The ruler of the Jews. Now this man had heard Jesus speak. And knowing that as a teacher of the law, he knew that when the Messiah comes, he would be doing some extraordinary things. So Jesus, Nicodemus came 
to Jesus by night. Now, he wanted Christian, the, the message of Jesus to be, maybe you need to keep a particular law or interpret a particular law a certain way to inculcate the kingdom of God. Maybe, you know, I'm missing something. There's something this man is saying that's making me feel empty. It's making me feel just discombobulated. And he came to Jesus, hoping that Jesus would say, you know, Nicodemus, your interpretation of Deuteronomy, your interpretation of this particular law is wrong and you need to begin to... He was looking for an idea, a philosophy to, to augment what he already knew. But when Jesus looked at him, and said, Nicodemus, I haven't come to give you a theology. Nicodemus, you got all the theology you need. Nicodemus, I'm not coming to give you another interpretation to go with Rabbi this and Rabbi that, Elel and Rabbi Shammai and all the different Rabbi. I have not come with that, but I've come with a message that says that you must be born again. And he was saying that Nicodemus, and I, I'm not just I, Adding an idea to your life is not enough. You have to be born again. I want to talk to you about being converted because in this whole change, what's going to cause the church to stand is because there are some people that is con are converted. Oh, I feel like preaching now. There are some people that they haven't just ascribed to a church. They're not looking for something to do on a Sunday morning. They're not looking for their children just to have virtues and have good morals. But there are some people that have been touched by the blood of Jesus. Their lives have been transformed and they're converted. And that doesn't change whether you are locked up in your house. That doesn't change whether or not you cannot go to church. I'm converted on the bus. I'm converted in my workplace. Wherever I am, I'm converted. I'm not converted just on a Sunday morning. It means to be a Christian, irrespective of the change in society, it's someone that Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you have to be, and here it comes, born again. Oh, that sounds too radical. Jesus said, you're so messed up, God can't even work with what you have. God needs to start all over again. Be born again. That means that God is going to completely transform you. Your thinking your being and everything about you. For no one, and you know what he said, no one could perform such miracles. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And what I'm saying today is that the essential thing, whether you come to church physically, whether you, you're not go to, able to come to church and you have to stay at home, when you are converted, it makes no difference. Because when you're converted, you are not converted to an ideology. You are not con converted to a particular church teaching, but you're converted to the Lord Jesus Christ and you have a living faith. Now, get this. The word that Jesus used when he said to Nicodemus, you have to be born again. It's a Greek word, anagonesos. It actually means you have to be born from above. Nothing you can do can help you. Your renewal, your transformation, what you are looking for in the change that you need is beyond you. It has to be initiated, glory to God, by God and what you need to initiate this is faith. He said, Nicodemus, you need something, but you cannot find it in your theology. You cannot find it in the books of the law. You cannot find it in the teaching of Rabbi Ilel and Shammai and all the different rabbi. You cannot find what you are looking for. And a lot of you have been looking for things and it's exacerbated by this COVID-19. So many people have, who cannot go to the bars, who cannot do things that they normally would do, and they, who've been searching for pleasure. And these rooms and aspects of and ideas that you could go to to anesthetize the things that you, you're looking for, whether it's alcohol, whether it's drugs, everything has been affected. People are committing suicide because what you need is beyond you. 
You need something, but you don't have it in you. And so first of all, you have to be converted. A question to you, you'd know when somebody's converted, when they don't have the trappings of religion around them, they still live right. Oh, glory to God. Oh, I don't care whether the preacher preaching or somebody watching me. I don't need people to be catching me on a camera or in wherever. But I am converted from the inside out. And so you have to be converted. And conversion then is the essential, is the aspect of our faith and our living that transcends everything that we have. It's the lowest common denominator. It's an experience that you cannot slide by or skip by. It's an experience that cannot be replaced by the things that we give and do to make you feel good. Secondly, in addition to spiritually converted, where your spirit is made alive, by the things of God. When you come alive, conversion is, is, is bringing your spirit alive. To be quickened, we use all kinds of words like regeneration and being quickened, a new birth. But it simply means that I used to be dead to spiritual things, but now I'm awoken to spiritual things. And now I'm awoken to, now I can, now I can engage with God. My prayers is a whole new conduit has opened up to me that I was completely dead to, separated from. So you need that to happen. And, and this is key because when that happens, it's not just predicated upon gathering together. It's not just a, a religion or ritual or tradition, but it's something living. It's something that you take with you wherever you go. Secondly, you need to be transformed. Now, to be transformed is something, again, that is the essential quality of being a Christian. And it doesn't matter what happens in the world. This idea of being transformed is psychology. A psychological transformation has to take place. We read about this in Romans chapter 12, where the Bible says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And listen to this, verse 2. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. And here the word transformed actually means like a, 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 to, be, to, be, to be literally metamorphosized. Be transformed by the renewed of your spirit. Hallelujah. And, I, and, and when you think about this, there has to be a psychological transformation in your life. You have to, your mind has to be changed. That when your mind is transformed, it doesn't matter. You're going to worship whether you're at home. You're going to worship whether you're at church. You're going to worship whether other people are worshiping. Or you're going to worship when you're by yourself. When your mind is transformed, this transformation of the mind is something that needs to happen. That you are born of the spirit. And thirdly, in addition to this, being spiritually awoken. No matter what's happening, you're alive unto God. When you are alive unto God, you don't need, it's not essential to have things around you. How many of you practiced worshiping God, had a revival in your own kitchen? Oh, hallelujah, in the shower, wherever you may be, because the Spirit of God is working in you. Then your mind is now transformed and conforming you to the things of God. And lastly, you need to be, hallelujah, transformed in your mind and your behavior. As your mind is changed, no matter what, your behavior will change. You're going to live right. You're going to walk right. It doesn't matter whether or not the, the word is preached. You're going to live right. It, it means that if they don't invite me back to the church, if the church door doesn't open for a long time, I'm still going to live right because my, my life has been changed and transformed. And I want to say to you today that it's so important. <laughs> 
that this really tests that when we are transformed in our minds, then it means and the way we behave, the things that we do, and the three things that we need to make sure that we are doing because we are transforming them in our minds. The Bible says, first of all, we need to love God. When you love God, it makes no difference where you are. Number two, it means that you need to love yourself, and you cannot love yourself unless you love God. Because if you, even if you are down on yourself, when you know that God loves you, you will have to love yourself. And number three, you'll have to love your, your neighbor as yourself. And right now, I want you to just begin to, to celebrate your faith. To begin to recognize that my faith is my faith and my faith must be practiced and lived out, not just in the church, not just in because there are things that make it easier for me to exercise my faith. But if I have to reorientate my living in order to accommodate my faith, I'm going to do it. I want you today, today to get excited and to know that your faith can, be, can take whatever you're going through. Your faith is able to walk you through if you maintain that you are converted and you are transformed and you are, your body and your life is changed, God is going to always be with you walking with you and no weapon formed against you shall prosper hallelujah, so I want you to, to be assured today that your faith is big enough to take what you're going through, it's been through a lot more than what you're facing right now, and so I'm going to ask you to just, hallelujah, join Join me in prayer right now as we begin to give God praise and thanks for the fact that you are saved and born again. And if you are listening to me and you, are, you don't know what we're talking about, you have not been born again, you have not asked Jesus to come into your life, I want you right now to bow your heads and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life Lord Jesus come into my life I praise you now forgive me of my sins wash me I surrender my life to you for the rest of you as we begin to close with worship Rejoice where you are. Don't be anxious. You are saved. You are redeemed. You have been washed by the blood. God is with you. Oh, I wonder if you can just give God a praise right now. We are learning something from this. That you can demonstrate your faith wherever you are. And wherever you are, God is with you.